Before we get started with the panel, I wanted to turn it over to uh, our two sponsors, our hosts for the event first, and allow them to bring greetings on behalf of the organization. So I'll turn it over to Kim Simmons from IPAC first. Hello, everyone. So thank you so much for coming. So anyway, I just wanted to give you guys, thank you for coming um, and just let you know a little bit about IPAC, especially for those people who come from the politics on tap. So IPAC is actually a collective of public sector employees and people who work <coughs> in the public sector who are interested in sharing knowledge, learning, and talk about issues. Um, we do a variety of things. So we host events like this, or co-host them in this case. Um, we actually run awards for new public servants. Um, so that's on our website if you're interested in ever nominating someone. Um, and then in addition, we also do a public service uh, graduate internship program. So I know there's some students out there, so that's also something we do where we help um, students partner with either like the city of Edmonton or the government of Alberta to try an internship to see what it's like in, in the real world. So um, we have a website, so IPAC ERG. Feel free to go look it up and see if there's something that interests you. And um, have a lovely evening. And then I'm going to introduce David Muddle, who is um, the boss of Politics on Tap. That's, um, your new, that's the new title. <laughs> yeah, the boss. boss. The, the boss. boss. <laughs> Here you go. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Jim, and thanks for the new title. That's awesome. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> Politics on Tap, many of you have uh, probably attended one of our uh, social events in the past. We try to organize uh, an opportunity for folks from across the political spectrum, a variety of different views, uh, to have a safe place to come and network and talk to other political uh, armchair uh, analysts that want to have good discussions about the issues of the day. Uh, so we organize it about three, four times a year, usually coinciding with key elements in the political calendar, like you know, Super Tuesday, uh, a provincial budget, an election, those kinds of things. Um, there's three of us involved in politics on tap uh, right now that carry the can for organizing this, uh, these events. Uh, one of them is Stuart Tate. I haven't seen Stuart arrive yet, but uh, Stuart uh, Tate is the owner and uh, operator of High Street Insurance. Uh, myself uh, and I own a management consulting company called M Consulting, very clever name. Uh, and uh, also Najib Jutt, who owns uh, Statecraft and uh, Elite Partners as well. Uh, and we'll be hearing from Najib in a little bit. So we've been doing this for a few years and we're delighted to be partnering with IPAC as a little bit of uh, credibility and formality to our events. <laughs> Normally we just walk around with beers in our hands and talk about whatever we want to. So. Uh, this is new for us as well, and we're delighted that you guys reached out to part with us. So enjoy the panel. Okay, thanks very much, Kim and David. Um, so I'll introduce the panel to start off with. Immediately to my left is Dr. Andrea Wagner, who is uh, who is assistant professor uh, at McEwen University in the Anthropology, Economics, and Political Science Department, and her expertise is in EU politics, and she actually is the Jean Monnet Chair for EU Politics at McEwen University. It was just awarded this year. Uh, beside her, we have Najib Jutt, who is... Yep. <laughs> the owner of Statecraft uh, Consulting. And then we have Dr. Rafat Alam, who is uh, a professor in the Anthropology, Political Science, and Economics Department, and he is an economist. So, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend about half an hour, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions to get the ball rolling, then I'm going to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions. What we'll have to do is either get you to come up and just grab the mic, to ask, or if you want to, to ask your question from the back, if you can ask, and then I'll repeat it to make sure everybody heard. We'll do a little bit of that. We won't spend too long doing questions from the audience because we want to give you guys a chance to mingle, obviously, and network. So we'll ask. We'll have a couple of audience questions, and then what I would do, we'll end it, and we'll. I would ask you to come up and ask the panelists directly if you have any further questions or anything that you'd like to chat about. Okay. So obviously, this event is about 
Uh, the provincial budget, uh, largely, we can stray from that to a certain extent, depending on what the panelists want to do, but that is sort of our organizing theme. Um, so, the first question that I'm going to ask the panelists, and I think we'll start with, with Andrea, and then we'll just go across to the other side of the table. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to highlight was, in this budget, and the budget in the fall, uh, Premier Kenny and the UCP have been faced with a slow Alberta economy, uh, and they face that with following a course of cutting spending to eliminate the deficit in around four years. Now, this is a different strategy than the Harper federal government, and obviously Kenny was a cabinet minister uh, in that government, uh, when they faced the Great Recession in the late 2000s, where they actually introduced an economic stimulus package. So, given that they were in the same party, um, and Kenny is now the premier, I was interested in your thoughts on why the Kenny government and the UCP have followed a different course than the Conservatives at the federal level, and what is different about these two different situations that's being faced in Alberta versus the late 2000s and the Great Recession? All right, um, is this on? Yeah, yep, sure. for sure. Okay, uh, thank you for coming first of all and thank you for the invite. Um, jumping into 2008, I remember that day very clearly because I was a first year PhD student at Carleton University and we were having our comparative politics course and our professor came into the room and said, capitalism is over. Um, it's kind of at the end of history, but with a little bit of a twist. And uh, it was also the election. So for those who remember 2008, uh, Harper is uh, facing some difficulties because they want to win in that election. Uh, I don't think that there was much spillover to Kenny, and I don't really think that we can compare the two budgets because we're also facing uh, different circumstances. The financial meltdown was uh, a huge problem. It was compared to the 1929 um, uh, crisis, the, the uncertainty, the financial impact was so much graver than just facing a slow economy and a high budget deficit that we're facing right now in Alberta. So it is a little bit like comparing apples and oranges. But if we have to look at how uh, back then uh, the finance minister, who was uh, Jim Flaherty, reacted, he died in 2014. He started traveling around Canada and he went to Saskatchewan and asked to talk to businesses and kind of wanted to have a feel in 2008 how grave this crisis is. Now the crisis again uh, had a different locus. It uh, was not a crisis that erupted in Canada. It was a crisis that erupted in the US and it was a crisis that could have been or was completely basically blamed or pushed on the United States deregulation in 2000. Uh, starting the whole uh, Bush era, right? So um, the question was, how are they going to react? And let's not forget that originally they believed that running a deficit, running a 15 or 20 billion deficit would be, would be enough and they wouldn't need a stimulus package. And that stimulus package was very, very expensive. However, the International Monetary Fund in November pushed Canada to devote at least 2% of their GDP to a stimulus package. And that year in November, already 71,000 people lost their jobs according to Stats Canada. So that really pushed uh, the Conservatives and the opposition was pushing them as well to have a stimulus package that is more or relies on more than just deficit spending. So again, the uncertainty, the crisis, how dark and black and difficult this would, it will be was also pushed by the finance minister back that time. Kenny uh, and the budget today, if again we're comparing apples and oranges, um, I think that the sense of urgency, while it's high, is not as high as it is what it was in 2008. And uh, I believe that the current government thinks and believes that um, uh, cutting spending is enough to get rid of a $77 billion debt, which of course is uh, problematic, and we'll speak about that later. Yeah, I mean, you know, stimulus works. Uh, I don't really understand why that wasn't a part of the budget or, or a bigger part of the budget. Um, I think there's a, a few factors at play. Um, <clears throat> you know, when, when, when government cuts spending, it actually increases your debt to GDP ratio, right? And we have the lowest debt to GDP ratio, Alberta does, in the country. So there is room to play there. Uh, in terms of stimulus, uh, and also, you know, that's what creates jobs. If your if your goal, like this government's goal, is to uh, get uh, unemployment down to five percent from six point nine or wherever it is right now, 
7.3 now? Okay. Every day it, it gets I higher. It up. Yeah. So um, uh, then, you know, you want to be creating jobs, not cutting jobs. I, as a business person, you know, I, I understand the reasons for cuts. Sometimes you have to trim the fat. Sometimes you have to move backwards to move forward. You know, they believe that our public sector employees are overpaid. Our doctors are overpaid. We have too much fat in healthcare. So, you know, that's, that's the reasons for the cuts. But, you know, this, uh, the blue ribbon panel have always been confused on why they didn't look at the revenue side of the equation. Um, I always thought that that was for just the, the fall budget that, you know, here's, here's where we're going to cut the fat. But then, you know, I thought for maybe the spring budget, there, there would be a look at the revenue side, but it doesn't seem like this government, like past governments has any, any uh, stomach for, for the things that we need to talk about. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the revenue side a little later. Okay, so the Kennedy government wanted to uh, solve a structural problem in Alberta. So it's totally different from the uh, financial crisis. But uh, to solve the structural fiscal problem, uh, they're still depending on the uh, resource revenue. So, and as we know, for too many years, resource revenue follows a business cycle uh, and just cutting spending will not solve the problem. Uh, uh, the other side is, the other point is that they are betting everything on one policy only, and that is reducing the corporate income tax. And yes, you can reduce the corporate income tax, you can make Alberta as competitive as, as possible in terms of tax, the lowest tax jurisdiction in North America, but at the end, it depends on many other external factors. It depends on how the internal within Alberta private sector and uh, international investors will react to this tax competitiveness. And, and government can only create that environment, but uh, it, there are lots of uncertainty. So, and, and the way the news are flowing in with the stock market crash that happening, that's happening with the coronavirus, uh, I, I think this is a bad time for not having a stimulus. Okay, yeah, so maybe we could just follow up on that a little bit, and because that was sort of leads into my second question very well. Um, it's been governments of all political stripes that have sort of been part of this long tradition in Alberta of having reven resource revenue being a large part of the equation and potentially relying on, relying on what could be relatively optimistic oil and gas price projection. So I think it's in the budget, it's $58 a barrel, and right now it's hovering in low 50s, I think. 47. Yeah, okay, so even under 50, uh, which leaves at least a little bit of risk, right? And, or hedging the bets that this will increase. So what would need to happen in this province, because we've seen that it's been governments of different political stripes, to actually have a more serious conversation about moving away from resource revenue as a, as a large source of revenue moving to other sort of uh, methods. And given the comments by the finance minister in the last couple of days about maybe needing to more comprehensively review that type of thing, is there a bit of a, a shift going on? And what would that have to look like to actually sort of seriously put some of these things on the table? Like, I don't want to get in trouble if I say it, but provincial sales tax. I wanted to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to start into Sure. So, you know, everybody keeps keeps talking about the the political suicide tax, as they call it, the PST. And uh, the reason why it's called the political suicide task, ta tax is in 1936, the Social Credit Party introduced a 2% consumption tax. And there was so much public outrage that they had to repeal it a year later. Ever since then, no one will touch it. Right. So. It's kind of interesting because I mean, the world has changed, right? I think that people, and I think especially business people and, uh, and, and citizens in general understand that you know, relying on uh, natural resource revenues is, is like trying to wait for the, to win the lottery, right? We've seen it over and over again. So I don't think that citizens with the amount of engagement and information we have at our, at our fingertips nowadays would be against at some sort of uh, consumption tax, especially if I mean, you outlay it to them, which makes financial sense. First of all, a consumption tax is a lot less costly to administer than things like corporate income taxes. You know, the arguments are that if a PST 
uh, overly uh, taxes, punitively lower income earners, well, you offset that with a tax credit, right? Like we do with GST, right? You offset it with bringing down some personal income tax uh, for everyone, uh, middle class earners, right? There's lots of ways to balance it. Actually, forget PST altogether. HST to me makes way more sense. So harmonized sales tax makes more, more sense because it's even less costly to minister, right? Add it on, harmonized sales tax, you add it onto your GST, add on three, four, five, six, eight percent like some provinces and administer it the same way. So what happens is uh, the federal government collect, collects that extra percentage, gives it back to Alberta. For businesses and other, uh, other organizations, it's as simple as you know, how we handle GST already. already. So there's no administration uh, issues there. So there's, you know, the other beauty of HST, which, you know, I think people forget, you get income that you wouldn't get with a PST or with personal income tax because tourists who come to this country would be paying a consumption tax. So we wouldn't see that revenue no normally. Transient workers who wouldn't pay tax here in the province, we would now see a tax from them. So I think some projections said $800 million of un unrecognized revenue right now we're leaving on the table by not having a consumption tax. Let me jump in here with some data. So if you look at the budget on page 169, it's titled Alberta's Tax Advantage. And I would uh, reformulate that to Alberta's Opportunity Cost. Uh, if Alberta would have a similar uh, tax system as Ontario has, then they would collect, or we would collect additionally, 14.4 billion a year. If it would resemble that of British Columbia, it would be 15.1 billion. And if it would resemble that of Newfoundland, it would be 25.5 billion. So what does this mean? It means that when you are running a 77 billion deficit, you do no longer have the luxury to um, not tap into resources that you're foregoing. You cannot balance a budget just based on giving uh, corporate tax cuts and cutting expenditure, right? Um, if we would reformulate this conversation, I would ask Albertans, do you want to keep your job or would you like to pay a 4% sale tax? I think the conversation would shift into a different direction. There were 1,400 people who lost their jobs in the public sector. There were 240 people who lost their job at SAE. There are a lot of salary freezes. There are a lot of more jobs uh, that are lost. Uh, tuition fees are going up. So if we were to ask our students, would you prefer paying a sale tax or $800 or $900 more in tuition fees, maybe they would opt for a 4% sale tax. And I do believe that setting a sale tax at 4% which is still much lower than Saskatchewan and much, much lower than British Columbia, right? Uh, gives still uh, Alberta comparative advantage. We can still flourish without the deficit. Uh, I think the conservative uh, voters in uh, Alberta, uh, we can sell tax by telling a different kind of story. If we tell that story in the way that it will create freedom for the consumers, you pay more sales tax if you consume more. So it's a freedom the freedom goes back to the consumers, that it, it, the amount of tax you pay depends on your consumption. And so that way we can, we can sell it, but um, the reality is at this point of austerity, I don't think sales tax, though we advocate it, all the economists will be for it, but it's not a reality. If uh, a sales tax can be brought back, probably it has to be the next round of the government after four years. No, you know, one of the key issues with bringing in a sales tax that people shy away from it is people don't trust government with when it comes to new taxes, right? We're always introducing taxes and we say we're going to use it one way or the government says they're going to use it one way uh, and then they use it another way, right? And it's, uh, or it's overly punitive or it's like our federal gas tax, you know, that was supposed to be temporary, right? So I, I think that's the issue is that I think that whenever you poll Albertans, they're four to one or three to one against a provincial sales tax. And I don't think it's because they don't necessarily understand the value of it. I think they don't just don't trust the government to spend more of our money wisely. Just one more thought. Yeah. So I think the gravity of the situation is underestimated, right? Uh, if uh, the budget put all their eggs in the oil basket um, the, and they overestimated how much uh, oil revenue, right, they can generate. Um, they're forgetting about the pandemic and the crisis that is right now happening. There's no more toilet paper at Costco. Um, that's a problem. Um, so that means that uh, the revenue side is uh, basically um, reflecting inaccurate figures. 
And I think in that context, it would be very important for the conservatives to exercise the prudency that they exercised a couple of years ago or a decade ago, when they underestimated the price of oil and they planned their budget accordingly. That strategy didn't uh, apply this time. Yeah, and so just to add to that, so I think like Gordon Campbell in DC demonstrates some of the challenges, right? Where he decided to put forward the HST and it was something that he had at least not said and even actually kind of said that he wouldn't do. And so I guess I think it's something, at least from my perspective, that you have to be upfront with people about in terms of getting a mandate from it as opposed to sneaking it, like not sneaking it, that's not the word I want to use, but like doing it in the middle of your mandate if you haven't campaigned on it. Because it certainly hurt Gordon Campbell. And to a certain extent with the carbon tax, it with the NDP, again, they left themselves open to the criticism that they hadn't campaigned on a carbon tax as well. So it is something where you really have to finally thread the political needle, I think. Um, but good discussion about what some of the realities are around that and what some of the ways we could maybe potentially frame the discussion in a different way. Because in some ways, it feels like it always comes up and people always talk about it. You can find a lot of people that say, yes, that makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't seem to translate into policy. I know, but you know, if not this government, then which government? You know, there's, no, there's nothing on the horizon that says this government isn't going to be in power for another 40 years. And the mandate that they have, so you know, this is the perfect time for them to have taken that risk. Yeah, fair, and I think I do agree that it probably has to be a right of center government that owns or has ownership of the economy in terms of as an issue that needs to do it, uh, kind of like the only Nixon could go to China uh, analogy. So I think that that is definitely the case. But I'm thinking like maybe second mandate, that type of thing potentially. Sure. Um, so. The other question, this is the last one for me, but the budget references its fair deal, the government's fair deal panel and asks for about 2.4 million, or exactly 2.4 billion, from the federal government from the fiscal stabilization fund, as well as the exclusion of non-renewable resources in the equalization formula. And obviously over time, there's been a lot of rhetoric blaming the federal government for Alberta's woes and misinformation spreading particularly about equalization and how it works. So I wanted to ask how reasonable are the demands in Alberta's budget and how can we create a discussion about fiscal federalism that is constructive rather than inflammatory? All right. So when it comes to equalization, the problem with equalization is that it's very, very poorly understood. Um, so let me advance some bullet points here. When it comes to transfer programs on the federal level, Canada has three. It has the Canada Health Transfer, the Canada Social Transfer, and Equalization. The Canada Health Transfer and the Canada Social Transfer are based on population. The reason why Quebec receives more is because they are twice as much populated as Alberta, right? When it comes to equalization, the reason why Alberta is spending or sending, I'm using Kenny's vocabulary, $20 billion a year to other provinces is because people in Alberta have higher incomes. The formula of equalization takes into account of how much revenue would the provinces generate under an average national taxation formula. And just because in Alberta more rich people live, Alberta has to send also more money in form of equalization. So the problem with equalization is that it is formulated and framed as a positive, or sorry, as a zero sum game. The money you are giving away is money that you lose and it goes to other provinces. It is perceived to be unfair in the context that there is a huge deficit in Alberta. However, the formula is very, very poorly understood. And this is why it's not just Kenny who misuses it. Legault in August said that Quebec's constitutional right is to receive equalization payments, which is not necessarily true. Equalization formula was developed in 1967 and enshrined in the, in the Constitution in 1982, which can be changed. However, any question around equalization can only happen or any reform and debate or referendum um, if the equalization formula is well understood and understood why Alberta pays more into it. So I think it's a political rehearsal. To it, it's a tactic to get uh, gain some uh, like the fiscal uh, side on the fiscal side some transfer payments but I mean uh, at the end of the day if we federally if we stick with a social welfare state model uh, then uh, equalization will be there so it's, it's just a political heretic to me I love uh, being on panels with academics they do all the heavy lifting and then I can 
I can just use anecdotes. Equalization bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I truly believe, and Andrew and I have had many conversations about this, that the reason why Albertans elected uh, Premier Kenny is because they wanted a strong man. They wanted uh, someone who would make those tough decisions and go to bat for them. And that's what he's doing. And he realized, and he knows that, and that's what he's doing. Also, you know, another, you know, political... Uh, strategic move 101 is to try to divide and make sure other people get blamed for your decision making, right? So if I can blame the federal government, you know, they're not giving us any stabilization, then, you know, equalization is unfair. And then I can pass on blame to, you know, academic institutions because they'll have to raise, uh, they'll have to raise tuition, you know, if I can de-index and then still look like, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually raising the budget by 1%, but actually, no, you're, you're uh, cutting it by 3% because of population increases and, and inflation, then you know uh, that allows uh, allows the government, the current government, to make sure that you know there's always somebody else that people can blame, and, and I think that's what's going on here. I think it's, uh, it's strongman tactics. If if Edmonton and Calgary, where most of the economic activities take place in Alberta, if they start saying that okay, we are sending too much money to the provincial government, we want our money back, uh, will that work? So so it, it's a political rhetoric like that. But it's also a very dangerous technique, and here I'm just bringing my European background uh, to the forefront. We only have to look at Brexit to understand that uh, referendums that are poorly understood can backfire. Referendums that are politically motivated can backfire. Look at David Cameron. He has retired from his political career, despite the fact that he was a talented politician. Uh, so I would uh, urge Albertans in this respect to first understand the for formula. I should start teaching it in my classes. From now on, I will start my courses with the equalization formula, uh, decided, even in American politics. So uh, before I speak about medicine, I will speak about the equalization formula. We'll just share this video. We'll, oh, yeah. yeah where are you explain it? I will just play. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because it's very upsetting to see that it's so poorly understood and it leads to so much division and polarization because it basically uh, creates animosity and antagonism between Albertans and Quebecers and between Canadians, right? It kind of creates an identity that is no longer a Canadian identity that is primary and important, but it's a provincial identity. So if you're going to uh, use this as a political tool, then we can also have, we have to also understand that that polarization creates then further political um, issues and problems, such as vaccines. Right. So. Uh, that's it for me in terms of my questions. What I wanted to do was to give in a, a couple of audience members a chance to ask a question. As I said at the start, we're not going to go, I'm going to go through one or two questions and then to get everybody a chance to stand up and stretch and, and network, uh, I won't, I'll ask you to come and ask the panelists one on one if you have any questions. But we do have time for one or two questions from the audience to address to the panel as a whole. If anyone would like a question, either if you feel like you can shout it, I can re. Uh, no. Yeah, or so. Yeah, so if you could come up and I'll just give you the microphone, that would be great. My brother. Hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so my question is uh, interestingly enough, it's Super Tuesday in the US. I just took a look at the results, they're all unofficial, they're all at the you know, 30% in range, so there's nothing to report there. But my question was, um, <clears throat> it was around Kansas and the experiment that they tried. And I'm just wondering if any of you might be able to shed some light on that. In the sense that about five years ago with the Republican um, dominated government, Kansas just cut all of their taxes, all their state taxes, anything that the state could get their hands on, they cut completely with the idea of let's become basically a corporate tax haven paradise mm -hmm. in the US. Uh, and I and my instinct tells me that Jason Kenney is ideologically aligned with that same school of thought in terms of fiscal discipline. And so I guess my question was, do you, maybe not with Kansas, but in general, do you know of any quote unquote success stories that you think the Kenney government would use in their um, you know in their drive to cut corporate tax? Well, what have we had? Encana left, Husky left, yeah. Tech Frontier. Said they will. So, one kind of yeah, one after the other. So, you know, what uh, the message it sends me is that large corporations aren't interested in 1%, 2% tax breaks. What they're interested in is environments that are stable, 
uh, and environmentally conscious and don't have such volatile economies, um, don't have issues human with, capital. don't have human capital, don't have issues with their indigenous population. You know, these are the kinds of things that large corporations are interested in because at the end of the day, more than anything in a large corporation, you want stability, you want to be able to predict the future. And we don't guarantee that in Alberta. And I don't think, you know, having the lowest uh, corporate income tax in the country is going to achieve that. The, the provinces or the states and countries that become tax havens, you know, they do that as part of a, a, a long term strategy. They don't do it all at once. And it's many other factors. A, they usually don't have other resources that they can rely on to attract uh, attract uh, large corporations. So, you know, that's a source of revenue for them. Uh, but I don't think that Alberta, that's the case for Alberta. As I mentioned in the beginning, that they're baiting everything only on one policy. And we have been talking about diversification forever. And, and now with the structural changes that's happening in the world, in the Alberta economy, we need diversification more. And this one policy of just corporate tax deduction may not work. So my opinion is there has to be more to that. And, and if, if we just depend on this one policy, what's uh, the other jurisdiction can run to the bottom too, and they can beat us in their uh, corporate tax policy. So for diversification, we need more than that. We need some targeted tax incentives beyond just regular corporate tax reductions. I think the biggest question here is, um, does trickle-down economics work, right? And there's a lot of research on that, and I've read many books on this topic, and uh, even Ford believed that trickle-down economics doesn't work, so when he wanted his employers to buy his cars, he just gave them more income and higher, higher, higher levels of income, right? And this is how you boost consumption. So um, empirical evidence, uh, did Husky not lay off a couple of hundred people after they received the uh, huge uh, corporate tax cut? No, right? They continue to lay them off. They are reorienting their focus towards Saskatchewan and other provinces. And um, similarly, did the other companies decide to stay? No. So having this race to the bottom will only lead to making the rich richer, sorry, I'm a social democrat, and increase inequality, right? Because if we also look at provinces where uh, constant cuts are made, then the losers are very much uh, um, accumulating in, in the most vulnerable group, and then the winners are those who are already millionaires. And then the question is, will they reinvest their money? Will they reinvest their proceeds into the province? Or is that money leaving the province and going to Switzerland or Cayman Islands? That is the real question. So what happens after the tax cuts? Do companies reinvest the money or not? This is why trickle-down economics and just a simplistic parsimonious assumption that you just give corporate tax cuts and everything will be wonderful is, 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 is just very, very uh, problematic. Especially when at the same time you're incentivizing uh, tech, uh, uh, investment in technology, right? So a large corporation that's learned how to operate uh, more leanly over the over the last few years, what do you think they're going to invest in bringing humans back or in technology so that they can replace those jobs? Okay, other questions? I can give you one more. Straightforward. Why do Albertans always choose oil and gas despite the volatileness <laughs> of the industry? And two, why do you think Jason Kenney continues to double down on that as his industry of choice? Oil and gas in this in this province has been the great equalizer, right? You know, in terms of you know, with no education straight out of high school, you could go into the oil and gas sector and make six figures and have a very nice uh, income and lifestyle, and uh, I, I'm not uh, begrudging anyone that, but you get used to that, right? And then especially if you could also rely on that, that's gonna happen every four or five years, um, it becomes habit, uh, just like any other, any other habit. So, you know, the thing I never understand is that, so what, like if, if oil and gas does by some miracle come back, and we have another boom in two, three years, doesn't it still make sense to also diversify? Doesn't it still make sense to, put in uh, sales tax so that we can have more stable revenue. Like to me, just that just makes prudent sense is that just prepare for those eventual downturns again after the next boom, right? But we just don't seem to have that kind of foresight in this province. I think oil and gas also allow this province to be spoiled when it comes to taxes. 
I think oil and gas allows uh, the province to spend more than they are or should be spending, and it also kind of has set us up in into in having this this its idea that uh, the Alberta advantage has to has to continue, and the times have changed, and I think many uh, have problems with accepting that. Uh, um, in the new times where also, in addition to whatever we just said, climate change becomes a salient issue and the two sound or look a little bit mutually exclusive, um, you cannot continue. Uh, it's not anymore the 80s or the 70s or the 90s and education becomes important and you have to be well educated. So the change global economy creates new losers and new winners and that kind of pits us against each other. Do you know how many Alberta governments in the last 60 years have balanced the budget without oil and gas revenue? Zero. Yeah, so we, we have to get out of that. <laughs> we have to get out of that dependence on oil revenue. And, and, and there, are, there are many academic uh, research out there, there are many policy research out there that gives formula to get out of that. But uh, politically, we are not doing anything. We, we, when we have good times, we, we forget that bad times are coming in future. Yeah, so one of the things I think it, it is, you see the political side, how it manifests itself in the sense that instead of going back to 10%, which is what it was before it went up to 12%, we have to we go to eight because we want to be the lowest and be able to say we're lower than 80 or 90% or whatever it is. And instead of having a 2% tax, we want to have zero. So we can say zero, right? Because there's a symbolic element to that where it's better politically to be able to say like we have no sales tax as opposed to saying we have a low sales tax that's 2%, right? So you can see how it drives us to extremes because it makes for a better messaging or narrative in a lot of cases. So. Okay, so I gave myself the leeway to have the last word. Um, you can ask one more question. There's one more question? Yeah, why sure. not? Take one well, more. Why don't we, I'm does ready. anyone in the more. audience have one more question? I don't need to ask there are so many questions right here. Uh, oh, we have a minister. We have a federal minister. Okay. He should be answering questions. Answering questions. <laughs> answering questions. Where's our stabilization money? <laughs> um, quickly, we, you talked about diversifying the economy and the reducing the dependency on oil and gas. I absolutely agree. Uh, but what, what part of the economy do you think that uh, if you were to give, give advice to the government, where would you say that invest in this area? That's where the future is for the economy. Well, let me start with the part of question. Oh, sorry. Uh, where should we invest? Which areas? How should we diversify? Uh, so I believe that we should invest in having a highly educated labor force. And for that, you need public goods. And universities and higher education is a public good. So you should have access to higher education. Again, I'm European, so education is a right and not a privilege. Um, and try to attract talent to this province. So diversification starts already at the post-secondary or even at a lower level when it comes to education. Human capital, high-tech industries, and of course, green energy. So you look at the advantages that we already have on the ground. Other than uh, oil and gas, what other sectors we have that is already uh, already there for many years and where we can value add. So one of the, uh, as Andrea said, one of our main resource is we have the youngest population in Canada. It's a destination for uh, within Canada migration and international migration too. So human resource going forward is one of our main resources. What are the other resources? We have great agriculture, but not much value added. We have uh, great research universities, research hubs with uh, tech sector, and uh, that's something we can diversify on. We have great tourism, that's where we can diversify on. But remember, these are the same things the government is saying too, but the only tool they are using is general corporate tax cut. There is all the targeted policies are taken out. And that's where I think we should go back. We need some targeted policies too. Uh, first of all, I think we should all welcome Amarjeet Sohi uh, to here today. You know, he represented Edmonton <laughs> on the national stage as an MP and as a minister with two you know, very important uh, portfolios and did an amazing job. 
uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, <clears throat> you know what? It, I always think we always want to invest in those things that are sexy, right? You know, like aviation and tech and <laughs> green economy, right? And, and to Dr. Allen's point, like we never look at the things that are our strengths. Agriculture, you know, the future, we're not looking at scarcity of e-commerce websites, guys, in the future, right? We're looking <laughs> scarcity of drinkable water and, and good food, right? So to me, if you're going to invest in tech, invest in agriculture, right? Invest in making, getting more out of the land that we have you know, at more uh, ethical, uh, is Japan ahead of us in beef, in quality of beef? Like, are, are you kidding me? Are, are you joking? Right. And that's because, you know, we take everything for granted. Again, Alberta beef, we take it for granted. You know, we, we sit back on our laurels. We have Alberta beef. Meanwhile, you know, Japan is able to charge a what a thousand percent markup on their beef. Have you ever tried to order some? Uh, what is it? Uh, Wagyu, Kobe and Wagyu beef. It's like a thirty dollar burger. It's delicious, though. It's worth every, worth every penny. Uh, you just got to save up for it. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I'm always thinking about that. You know, it was the same. You know, I lived in, in uh, I digress a bit here, but I lived in Pakistan for a couple of years. You know, and again, you know, investment in tech, you know, in websites and all these little tech startups and AI and things, and nobody's looking at it. You know, Pakistan would be perfect to be the breadbasket for all of the Middle East and for most of Asia, right? But no one's looking at that because it's not sexy. You know, farmers, you know, who cares about farmers, who cares about land, who cares about water? Well, just all those billionaires that buying, are buying up all the rights. Uh, one of my fears is that in, in the long run, uh, the U.S. West is uh, drying down for water and we'll have another resource that someone will come up with with the idea of sailing through pipeline to the U.S. West and yeah. we will be in the same drug again. Okay, so what I will do is I will bring the formal portion to a close. If you have other questions that you'd like to ask the panelists, I know some have to, to go relatively uh, soon, but if you can catch one of the panelists, feel free to carry on the conversation with them or amongst yourselves. And uh, thank you. I guess please join me in thanking all of our panelists. Thank you. Really great really discussion with lots of things to think about and lots of ideas to discuss. So please do so and enjoy the rest of the evening.